Well, thank you, Fazal, and uh, thank you also, Joel, and my other friends here at BITS. And uh, elsewhere, there is anybody happy to be watching that I may have met before. So yes, that's, that's today's title. Uh, it, it brings together some little bits and pieces that I learned from many people over many years. Um, listed there, I won't waste a few minutes by reading all the names and mentioning their contributions, but they are significant. And these include uh, ex-students and uh, ex-postdocs, ex-academic colleagues and collaborators from overseas. So um, I'll talk a little bit about non-classical symmetry analysis, <coughs> then classification in particular of nonlinear reaction diffusion equations. And I'll talk actually what I do from then on is actually use what I think is a new class of partially integrable partial differential equations that is still integrable in n space dimensions in one time. And uh, up, that becomes a chorus, and I use that chorus over and over again to go through various applications. Not with exactly the same equations, I, I must say, otherwise you'd be frightened now, wondering where the back door is. <laughs> but I'm not sure if I'll get through um, all five verses of this uh, song, but uh, it doesn't matter. I, I would never go beyond 50 minutes and then we'll have some questions. So, um, the, the version of non-classical symmetry analysis that I'm looking at is a particular type of conditional symmetry uh, that I think came out of George Blumen's PhD thesis. And he told me at the, near the end of his PhD, he had this idea to... Um, <laughs> as long as that's not an evacuation <laughs> So um, he had this idea of asking, what is the, the one parameter lead point symmetry possibilities? Uh, here I've just written a, um, a one parameter group of transformations here up to order epsilon in this group parameter, uh, where the generators of the transformation are labelled here as capital X's for the independent variables and capital U for the dependent variable. That leaves invariant the system consisting of a governing partial differential equation of nth order, uh, plus combined with the invariant surface condition and when you first see this invariant surface condition, it looks just slightly mysterious until you realise that this is just the condition that given a certain solution, U is a function, um, dependent variable U is a function of the independent variables XJ. Uh, that uh, solution is invariant uh, under change of epsilon. So we can differentiate that with respect to epsilon and get zero and then take epsilon to be zero and you get exactly this invariant surface condition. There are fancier ways of looking at that, but I think this is the simplest way to understand. Um, now, 1991, uh, we had a, a conference in Wollongong where we were talking about these things and we, we realised uh, that if this idea was to gain ground at all, then we had to do a full classification of at least some class of PDE with a free function parameter, which hadn't been achieved before. Um, so we chose um, to look at reaction diffusion equations, and uh, they have lots of applications, as you well know, and uh, some of those things I'll mention here. And we have a nonlinear diffusion term here and we have a source term here. Both of those can depend on the dependent variable, which in the case of soil water crop relations would be the water content. In combustion theory, that would be the temperature. Um, population genetics, that would be the um, fraction of a population with a certain gene. And uh, in population dynamics, that's the total population, etc. These, uh, these um, nonlinear diffusion type equations can always be somewhat simplified by the Kirchhoff transformation of 1891, uh, 
Now that was also the year when Stefan did his great work and also the year that Boltzmann did his great work on heat conduction. So it's a big year for heat conduction. Um, where you just take a, a new variable which is just the integral of the diffusivity that's non-linear and uh, basically then that removes one of the two non-linear terms from the diffusion. But the nice thing about that is that uh, if you can solve for this Kirchhoff variable u, then the flux is automatically read off as minus red u in the case of nonlinear diffusion. <coughs> so um, the first thing we thought of doing, of course, was doing the standard um, semi-linear reaction diffusion equations where we just have a nonlinear source term here. And um, Mansfield and Clarkson uh, went away um, by the way, we didn't decide to look at this um, class of PDEs first, but it, it was a natural thing to think of, and they thought of it independently, and uh, we submitted papers basically at the same time and had them accepted at the same time. But unfortunately for us, their papers seems to appear a year be before ours, so, um, so history can be cruel at times. <laughs> So um, what happens with non-classical symmetries is that um, if, you, if you insist that the transformation leaves the governing equation invariant, uh, then in the case of ordinary Lie point symmetries, we just have um, a set of linear PDEs equals zero, which are just the coefficients of a very large polynomial type equation that you get in terms of all the derivatives. Um, but now, if if we make a substitution through the invariant surface condition to eliminate one of those derivatives, then we finish up with quadratic PDEs for the infinitesimal uh, components of the symmetry rather than linear PDEs. Now, it just so happened that this class of PDEs here, luckily we were able to solve exactly. Sorry. And the, and the other uh, people, Clarkson and Mansfield, did it simultaneously. Luckily, we got the same answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that, that was surprising, the result, because it turned out um, the, the only genuine non-classical symmetries you get from these PDEs is the class where you have a cubic source term. Now, why cubic? I don't understand to this day. It just comes out of the structure of symmetry. The, the, the cubic um, source terms actually were very useful because it turns out they're very useful in population genetics, so we wrote a couple of papers on that. And in fact, not even all cubics, and that's even stranger. Uh, very strange. Um, naturally, then, um, in, in the class of applications I'm looking at, we would like to have nonlinear diffusion as well, and uh, we classified the class of nonlinear diffusion reaction uh, after that in um, one space and one time. By the way, my name's not on this paper because I said, guys, I've got lots of problems now ahead of the department. Go for it, leave me off, and I'm not contributing, but I'll start out something with a new PhD student whose name was Joanna Goard, and um, she worked through and found, uh, soon afterwards found the classification for the two dimensions plus time reaction diffusion. So in two plus one dimensions, um, something slightly peculiar came out of it. She showed me the results, the, the total classification, and something in there seemed quite peculiar. And it was um, saying you can, you can get a non-classical symmetry with an arbitrary reaction term. Now, first of all, I thought I didn't believe it, but then I saw that the symmetry is exceedingly simple. It's just a scaling of dependent variable and translation in time. And I thought maybe that's true, but that's kind of interesting, but probably not very useful. <laughs> I only realized about 20 years later uh, that, in fact, I can use this in lots of ways that I'll show you. Um, and, in fact, I tried to get Joanna to work on this, um, you know, several years later. She said, no, I'm not touching that stuff again. You know, you know what PhD students are like. Once something's done, you can't force me to touch that stuff again. So, but... She did come back to the fold quite recently. We had one paper at least. So um, now it turns out this extra symmetry occurs whenever there's this fixed relationship between the source term, which I've written as Q of U here, and the diffusion, which appears here as F of U, 1 over diffusivity. So as long as you've got this relationship, 
um, between the source term and the diffusivity, uh, you get this extra scaling and translation symmetry, which means uh, that you have a reduction that's possible, and the reduction is that the Kirchhoff variable uh, can be written as separated as just exponential in time times a function of space variables, where this function of space variable satisfies the linear Helmholtz equation. Now that's a surprise. So here we have a fairly complicated class of nonlinear PDE, and you get separation of variables into two linear equations. That, that's kind of surprising and a bit fortuitous. Um, it works in higher dimensions. It, you can soon check that this works in any higher dimensions. Now, sure enough, when you first show this to people, they're even slightly sceptical, but the proof of the pudding is in the eating, so if you just assume that you have a solution of that form and, um, you, and, and that obeys this linear Helmholtz equation, <coughs> you can substitute these into the governing nonlinear PDE, and sure enough, you just come up with this extra condition that diffusivity is related to reaction term in this way. Um, so, if you specify the diffusivity, then it's a simple matter to construct the reaction term because this u here is the integral of d. So you can always construct uh, the re corresponding reaction term from a given nonlinear diffusivity. Usually in mathematical modelling, we go the other way around because it's a reaction term that really drives the whole thing and drives the structure. So we'd like to be able to start with a reaction term. In that case, um, we have a differential equation we have to solve here for u of theta, and then the derivative of uh, u is, of course, the diffusivity. Now, classes of solution of this equation itself is quite interesting, but I won't digress anymore, but it, it is equivalent to a standard Arbel equation. So you have to classify the Arbel equations to get anywhere. Travesty. There's a change. Can, can, you, can you please mute your, mute your mic, please? Uh, that's all right. No, they, I think the people at the other end will suffer more because the feedback would be horrendous when it comes from here to here and back. <laughs> so I apologise, those but can no longer hear my talk. <laughs> <through the feedback. laughs> um, okay, so they have this class of um, what I'll call now partially integrable PDE, and uh, in the sense that if, if you take the system. Uh, beginning with the governing PDE, which I can easily write here in terms of Kirchhoff variable, uh, with this extra side condition, which is the invariant surface condition, exceedingly simple, it just says that U has to be exponential in time. This system, as a classical Lie symmetry group, that uh, includes a free function of the linear Helmholtz equation, a uh, free function of the free solution of a linear equation in the symmetry group. And, that, and that's usually a sign that it's integrable, except that this linear equation now is in one pure variable, so it's partially integrable. So there's a class of solutions you can get from solving the linear equation. <coughs> right, so the first use we made of this actually was to um, publish the, the very first known uh, exact solution of combustion reaction diffusion with a Renius combustion term. Now, the, the textbooks are still saying that there's no known exact solution with a Renius combustion term, because this, this Arrhenius combustion term, which I'll mention a little bit later, of course, is not analytic, quite difficult, but we actually managed to construct a diffusivity exactly, which I can talk about later if I get that. And after that, we um, <coughs> made some more exact solutions for um, diffusing population with either Fisher or Huxley growth law. And um, at that time, uh, Bronwyn Harjek, who actually is Joel's academic sister, they, they started PhDs about the same day and graduated on the same day, um, and pointed out to me that this still works if your nonlinear diffusion 
uh, as heterogeneity. It can depend on X, Y, and Z. And I thought, why would this work so easily? Well, it turned out, um, I realized then that um, you can replace this the class operator by any linear operator L that's elliptic, and you can still use this. And surprisingly, <coughs> you still get exactly the same relationship between reaction and diffusivity. You can then use that then to solve, to get some solutions for a very wide class of PDE. So it works with any linear operator. So um, d theta by dt equals any linear operator uh, acting on this Kirchhoff variable, uh, and then with a the reaction term. And uh, that will, you will always have that non-classical symmetry under those same conditions, that you have the same relationship between diffusivity and r of theta. So, so this appears to be a fairly um, important new class of PDEs that I, I don't think people were aware of before. <coughs> um, useful. Um, I, I can also tell you straight out, uh, this surprises me also, that once I realized 20 years after the event that these might be useful, everything I tried it on, it turned out to be useful. So sometimes you can be lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when the luck will run out, so I think I'm going to move to the new topic about now. <laughs> so um, the next thing we thought of doing, um, a, a person who's an environmental engineer approached me and uh, asked, can, can we do anything for unsaturated uh, soil water flow uh, with a plant root sink term? Now, this is a typical situation here uh, where we have rows of young sugar cane that are very thirsty they, they take out as much water as you supply every day. <clears throat> so, so you have these irrigation furrows here that are periodic. So could, could we solve something like that for soil water flow? With, with a sink term, which <coughs> is realistic because it shows that plant roots take water out of the soil as fast as they can and get they, until they get to the near wielding point and then struggle then it drops off. So can we come up with a reaction term that has that shape? Uh, you, you can see here this, this experiment goes back to the 1963 with um, a trefoil pot plant. It's, it's um, transpiring at the rate of something approaching a centimetre per day, whereas if you uh, took all the sun's radiation energy and converted that to latent heat, you'd, um, that'd be four centimetres per day. So you can see plants are pretty efficient at transpiring. They're amazing. Um, and you can see if you put this thing in clay, it's going to struggle to take the water out, not surprisingly, whereas if you put it in sand, it just merely takes water out until it gets near a wilting point and then drops. Now, now people in the um, hydrology literature claim to have solutions like that, but um, most of them are lying. No, they're all lying. I can say that straight out. Not one of them has a sink term that looks like that, but they can seal the facts on that. So, um, general theory uh, of unsaturated flow is uh, an extension of Darcy's law, which Darcy's law was written for saturated flow in 1856, um, that the um, flux density of water is proportional to minus gradient of um, pressure head, what the engineers call pressure head. It's basically writing pressure as an equivalent head. So, if, if you think of... Um, uh, pressure being rho GH, well this is the H in rho GH. <coughs> um, Buckingham around 1905 and I found out Richardson, the numerical analysis Richardson about 1903, independently had the idea of replacing this um, pressure head H by a potential energy H, as in MGH. So this is really potential energy per unit weight of water. So. Uh, then, then you uh, break the potential energy up into the gravitational part, which is minus z here, and uh, a attractive part due to capillary action here, which is negative. That's, that's an attractive potential. And when you put that constitutive law um, into the, the general conservation law, you get a highly nonlinear um, diffusion convection term here, and putting the plant roots in, I've also put a reaction term. 
Um, can someone tell me when I started? I just need to know if I need to hurry up or not. 10.30. 10.30, yeah, so I do need to hurry up somewhere. Um, this um, diffusivity here is um, soil water conductivity times uh, d by d theta of this potential head, the attractive potential head here. Um, it's, I'm just showing you this so you can see for a real soil these functions are highly nonlinear. This is the conductivity here. It's uh, highly nonlinear. This is an analytic model uh, which you can transform with the linear diffusion equation that I came up with in 1988, or actually a few years earlier than that. Um, where we use the um, standard inverse square diffusivity, which is known to be linearizable, then I found I could use um, a, a convection term, which is k prime of theta d theta by dz, k being of this one. Okay, and, and with that exact model, you get a potential energy function that in terms of hydraulic head looks like this, which is fairly realistic. Um, I, I must say, this is one of the few times ever, I'm, I'm terrible with equipment, but this is one of the few times ever, you know, I wrote a simple program in those days it was Fortran and not MATLAB. I put it in, out came that picture, straight out, and I was jumping for joy, I must say. It was, that was a good day. Um, so, so we're not dealing with um, the straight out Laplacian L anymore. We have a, a, an operator L which has both uh, diffusion and convection. And uh, when we write that in terms of the uh, Kirchhoff variable, which in the soils literature is written as mu here, uh, you have this extra term which is a convection term, g of mu d mu by dz, where this g is the ratio of decay by d theta over d. Now, it turns out this is close to a constant. People actually routinely measure this constant in the fill. It's always got the symbol alpha, and uh, alpha's got the unit of inverse length. So uh, alpha inverse is a standard capillary rise. It's a macroscopic unit. I won't talk about the scaling, but you can get the drift. I use a, a macroscopic length scale, which is a standard capillary rise. And the time scale is that length scale divided by the travelling wave speed of the water falling through the saturated soil. And that also is macroscopic. It can be, say, four hours for a loam. It can be days or weeks for a light clay or a clay. That's so macroscopic time also. So um, can, I, can I match up a D and an R uh, to get a picture of the type we're looking for? The answer is yes. Um, I, I can choose D to be exponential in theta, and uh, I, can, I can choose K uh, to be exponential in psi, which is equivalent, in fact, to having um, uh, dK by D theta over D being alpha. It comes out to be equivalent to K being exponential in potential energy. And uh, what can I do about R? Well, then R, in that case, comes out to be this uh, exponential type structure here which um, does have the kind of shape that I was looking for, right? So you can represent a um, soil, merrily, uh, a plant merrily taking water out of the soil and then dropping off and it gets near yielding point. So everybody's happy. As far as I know, this is the only case of Richard's equation with a water extraction term of that form that's been solved. Right, and um, these other pictures here I don't really need to show you, but these are just to satisfy the sceptical soil physicists that the functions are comparable to those that are well known in the soils literature that people know and love. So we'd like to be able to solve that problem I showed you before where you have periodic irrigation furrows and you're putting in water through those. Um, in this case, I'm only putting in a finite amount of water because I can only get exact solutions that are exponential in time. So I choose uh, e to the minus at, where a is positive. It'd be the, the picture here when I separate variables. So that means when you integrate that, you get a finite amount of water put in, uh, which happens in, in morning irrigation. You put in a finite amount of water because you irrigate at a fixed rate uh, for a finite amount of time. And uh, then the water goes through, uh, you replenish at night when the plants are no longer active, then, then you also replenish in the morning or late morning when they start to get dry. So this, this gives you some idea of what can happen. 
Um, at, at the end, after solving for mu, you have to go back and convert mu back to water content, which we can do simply here. And um, then, then we have this linear uh, kirchhoff helmholtz equation to solve uh, with flux boundary conditions. This is um, a constant flux through the irrigation furrows and a zero flux between irrigation furrows. And everything you have to remember pi is multiplied by e to the minus a t, so you're putting in a finite amount of water. Here. And um, <coughs> the um, it's it's a standard job to separate variables and solve this uh, constant coefficient linear PDE. And I can uh, show you the expansion here as a Fourier series. And um, the solution is here. This is um, plotted from the exact solution, and these numbers here are um, percentage of saturated water content. And um, you can see why irrigation furrows that uh, only 25% of the, of the uh, width of the region, quite effective, uh, because in the very driest spot here you get um, a water content which is close to 0.8 of saturation compared to 0 0.9 under the very wettest place. Now down here, of course, the water content has to drop off. Um, up here, the water content has to increase downwards for a while because we have a zero flux boundary condition here, so the gradient has to go backwards. So the gradient goes backwards for a while, and then the gradient will go forward, so there has to be a um, maximum water content here. And this has to occur at a cusp. I haven't yet found a, uh, a computer that can actually find that um, contour exactly, but I know it has to be there by pure logic. And this has to be horizontal because there's a no flow boundary condition across this plane of symmetry. So this is basically what happens eventually down here. Everything looks one-dimensional, and up here it's two-dimensional, so there's kind of a depth to one-dimensionality here. So uh, it, it's nice you can solve all that, you know, with that level of complexity. I've solved other boundary value problems. You can do this with any solution of that linear constant coefficient uh, Kirchhoff-Helmholtz equation. You can put in any boundary conditions and solve it. The, um, the numbers on here will be changing in time. Because we have separation of variables, these contours always look the same. It's just the, the water content on those change in time. <coughs> That's another thing to satisfy the soil physicists. This, this is a comparison with a prediction by one of their standard models compared to ours. It's uh, not far out. Um, I was going to talk next about um, phase field theory. Um, now, what I've done now, because I can do this for any linear operator, it's interesting to do it as, as we've done recently with a current PhD student. Um, look at a fourth order operator L here, where, where we have something that's like a nonlinear Kahn Hilliard operator here. And the Kahn Hilliard model came out as a phase field theory to. Um, allow for the fact that in uh, uh, a spatially dependent phase transition you don't always, you, you don't actually have a very uh, sharp transition between phases uh, as, as in the standard Stefan problem, but there is a thin layer where you have a gradation uh, from one phase to the other, where in between you have a mixture of phases. So the nice thing about that is uh, from these coefficients A and B uh, you have a natural length scale, which is the square root of mod A over mod B. So there's a fourth order diffusion term and a second order diffusion term plus a reaction term. Uh, the reaction term comes out of an earlier Allen Kahn field theory, which basically um, forces the system to prefer to go to a pure phase. For example, either pure ice or pure water, and it doesn't like a mixture of ice and water in between. So there's this. Um, natural length scale um, that gives you the kind of maximum thickness of this uh, mushy zone. Um, so um, given um, a reaction term, uh, I, I can then say that the um, diffusivity is, is a fixed point of this map. You see, 
um, I have this relationship here, um, which gives me the relationship between diffusivity and reaction, but I, I can look at this. First thing I tried to do, if I couldn't solve it, was look at it iteratively, and uh, it turned out that that gave pretty good results. Um, you, you can, so um, instead of writing this as an equation, you write it as the fixed point of an iterative map, and it's, it's integral here, so that means you've got a chance of this being contraction map and working, and it, and it does work. It's uh, better than it should, actually. And I don't really understand why that's the case. So, um, so if, if we just put in the um, cubic reaction term for the Alan Kahn model, um, where, where the attractive fixed points are for the two pure phases, and the one in the middle is a repulsive midway point, um, I can put in a cubic reaction term for that. I, I can then start the. Um, I know that the. I know the exact value of d at uh, phase zero, and that comes out to be two in the case that I've shown here. And I, I take that as my first approximation for the diffusivity, and then apply this iterative map. And d one and d two come out to be extremely close, and, they, and they're expressed exactly after integration. I, I can prove, in this case, that uh, we have a contraction map where the uh, contraction factor in the L infinity norm is about 0.97, but this is doing a lot better than that, which I don't really understand, so there must be a better way of looking at this with a better norm and a better function state. So you, you can't get uh, substructure solutions out of solving the underlying linear model, again, even in higher dimensions. And um, uh, it turns out that you, you can't get a positive solution where the phase can only be between 0 and 1 unless you're dealing with a length scale of the order of this Kahn Hilliard length scale. So everything seems to work, and we can show a bit of substructure here. Um, population model of a protected species. Um, this is a, a Fisher source term here in, in population dynamics that everyone seems to use. Uh, Fisher first came up with this for um, population genetics, in fact. And in fact, he was wrong because uh, I, I proved later that if you take Fisher's assumptions and uh, convert a discrete breeding cycle um, difference equation into a PDE, in fact, the source term comes out to be S, square, uh, S times theta squared into 1 minus theta. This is kind of interesting. Um, Fisher, by the way, spent the last four years uh, of his career and his life at the University of Adelaide, where, where my PhD supervisor actually used to eat lunch with him, and he said, well, you're lucky he's not alive now, because he didn't take too kindly to anybody showing him he was wrong. But, uh, <laughs> 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 to say the least. <laughs> anyway, um, we, we would like to um, look at radial solutions of this. So, um, when I was a kid, this was really my uncle sitting at this end of the boat, and that's usually <laughs> me sitting at the upper end. And so, this is the idea that you have a fishing exclusion zone, and any fish that managed to escape this exclusion zone would be harvested. So, you have this boundary condition basically zero population on the boundary here. And um, so, we can solve that. Um, um, just for that straight out reaction diffusion equation, again we transform into exponential times the solution of the Helmholtz equation. This k squared can be chosen. And um, we, in, in two dimensional radial, surprise, surprise, we just get a um, vessel function j naught of constant time bar. And we can impose a boundary condition at some place. And so this has to be uh, the first zero of the vessel j naught, which happens at KR1 equals lambda 1, which is about 2.4. But um, that solution, in fact, doesn't even exist. You, you don't get the exponentially decreasing solution unless um, the, the radius is uh, smaller than this quantity here. Right? So you don't get an exponentially decaying solution if the radius is bigger than this uh, bound here, which is a good thing because you don't want to kill off all your fish population. So that, that tells you a uh, minimum diameter 
uh, for a fish exclusion zone um, for uh, that extinguishing solution not to exist, which is a good thing. The bad thing is that when you put numbers in, even with a fairly slow moving fish which can you know, drift about 10 kilometres per year and it has a exponential growth when you leave it alone of about you know, exponential growth pop population in five years, uh, you finish up with a diameter of that circle which is just slightly bigger than 100 kilometres. So you can see where the problem is here. So, so to protect a species that even drifts 10 kilometres a year and um, regrows itself exponentially over five years, you need uh, 100 kilometres diameter. And that, that's a worry. I think your people in Africa um, understand these things a lot better than we do because there's a lot of good work going on around the place about ecology and management. Um, if, if I go through the same trick again, I, I know what the um, exact solution of the diffusivity is. It's, it's zero population. In order to get my solution to work, I can use that as my first estimate. And the second estimate, uh, D1, uh, is already pretty good because this theta equals one here is at the carrying capacity of the population. So you don't normally get populations much bigger than carrying capacity anyway. So this D1 is already pretty good. I can write down D2, the next iterate, exactly. And you don't need anything more accurate than that in a, in a rough population model. So everything works fine. As I said, much finer than it's got any right to. But uh, if people ask me to prove something, I say, no, no. I, I've got it to work. Your job to prove it. <laughs> Um, this is um, a, a more recent exercise again with um, Brahman Hajek who, who asked me about this problem. Um, she, she is interested in um, after fertilization of an ovum, we have a, a penetration point here, and at the penetration point there's release of calcium ions. Uh, this is most noticeable in um, amphibians. In fact, it's even been noticed in uh, some small mammals. So you have release of calcium ions here, and once the calcium ions reach a certain level at other places, there's a mechanism underneath the cortex of this large open cell that releases more calcium. So it likes to release calcium. Why? Because the calcium eventually, when I say eventually, but totally over a short time span, and some species is about 40 minutes, becomes saturated and it forms an eggshell, basically, of precipitated uh, calcite, and that stops more sperm getting in. And uh, believe it or not, that's a good thing, because if you get two sperm in one uh, ovum, that really mucks up the uh, genetics, so nothing can survive after that. So this is like the defense mechanism. So we'd like to have a model that does that. So naturally, we go to the common or garden um, pitch in the gumo cubic type source term, uh, where we have um, saturation of calcium here at beta equals one. Um, we have uh, zero reaction at beta equals zero, and, and we have a non-attractive um, fixed point here at beta equals beta one in, in between. And um, sure, with that solution I was talking about before, you can um, get an exact solution where the uh, distribution of calcium uh, approaches a constant here uh, point wise. This little circle here we left out because this is the embarrassing place as in any point source solution where you have a very high um, value of the dependent variable, much higher uh, than is physically possible. So we just say this is the small circle where the penetration took place. Through that small circle we have a finite source. Term. So it's releasing uh, calcium at a finite rate, and that rate goes down exponentially in time, so there's a finite amount released. And uh, the solution, you can see, although the solution for you is exponential in time, these contours for concentration here show that the concentration theta is no longer exponential in time, and that's because theta is a non-linear function of u. So we're not just dealing, in the end, with exponential type solutions. We're dealing, in the end, with a non-linear function of exponential type solution. And I had to explain that because other places where I've given this talk, that has not been easily understood. 
So um, we we can get the um, the situation where, where we have axial symmetry and everything just flows equally in all directions. Uh, this doesn't always happen. Um, sometimes um, you, you can have asymmetric solutions. This one here, the, the red zone of high calcium has a spiral shape, and that's been uh, observed experimentally. This is not my analytic solution here. This is, this is the case where we're close to saturation, and then we use um, just a linear expansion. So then we have a, a linear PDE, of course, for the um, difference between concentration and saturation, uh, which we can then expand with various uh, exponentials, um, where this L here is like the angular momentum quantum number of quantum mechanics. But the L here is now allowed to be non-integer uh, because we can have uh, that um, point source term at the North Pole here. Um, again, I can go through the same sort of iterative process uh, to construct a diffusivity that will do the job. Um, but, I, but I want to point out we can do slightly better because having got the next iterate of diffusivity, I've already told you that given diffusivity, we can construct reaction term exactly. So given that next approximation of diffusivity, we can get a reaction term that still does the same job that was set out to do because we can prove that that reaction term that's reconstructed has to have the same zeros as the, the target reaction term that we started with. And, and, these, and these zeros are the main part of, of the model. So it still does that job, exactly. Um, yeah, I've actually caught up a bit of time, which means I'm speaking at Australian pace and not um, Gips pace, I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, I'm sure I can re have time at the end to recap uh, to ask questions if there's anything that I haven't explained properly, which I'm sure is a lot. Um, so the last thing I mentioned, as I said, is this um, Arrhenius reaction term, uh, which comes um, from the, well, I think it comes from Gibbs and Boltzmann. I'm not sure whether Arrhenius thought it that way. I think Arrhenius kind of found this um, just by fitting data. But that certainly... Gibbs and Boltzmann would have said very quickly uh, that you have uh, uh, a probability of jumping to an energy platform which is your activation energy before you can activate a reaction and then it takes off, whether that be exothermic or endothermic. They can both have, have a, um, a activation energy and at a certain temperature there's a probability which is basically um, proportional to e to the minus activation energy over uh, Boltzmann constant times absolute temperature. So that's, that's basically um, why the um, Arrhenius combustion term is of interest. It's not, not quite exact because also there's a function of theta that comes in here. There are other, other kind of dependencies on temperature also that are, that are actually minor. Most people put in a polynomial times e to the minus 1 over theta. So if I take k equals 0, I can actually construct a diffusivity exactly. It, it looks just, in fact, at large, large temperature, but the um, reaction term that comes out is exponential at large temperature, and it approaches 0 rather than 1 small temperature. So in fact, you can write it down exactly in, in terms of the, the same exponential integral, log functions, exponential function. Um, we, we can um, get a solution also for quenching a fire if, if you have an exothermic reaction going on. Ideally, if you want to try to put the fire out from the boundary, you can't do any better at the boundary than um, force it to be absolute zero temperature. That's a very idealised boundary condition. And luckily that can put a fire out, um, because if it couldn't, there's absolutely no way of putting a fire out. And that just comes out to be, uh, at low temperature, that comes out to be the same solution that I showed you before with the j naught vessel function. Um, but at higher temperatures, it's not, it's not the j naught vessel function, it's a distortion of that uh, that approaches that as it gets colder. Um, you don't have to always think of that um, boundary condition as being absolute zero boundary condition. 
Um, you can also um, cut off the solution right here and write that and um, say that we're taking a smaller radius but we're putting in a Newton cooling law right there. So you get a linear Newton cooling law will give you the same solution over a, a smaller radius. The, um, from this Arrhenius reaction, the diffusivity function that I need to make the exact solution looks like this. It looks kind of weird, but at least it's, it's, um, it's flat at, low, at high temperature and it, it, it only jumps up by 40% in, in some region of of the inflection point of the Arrhenius reaction law. So it's, it's not going to change the character of the solution all that much because it's bounded. And that, and that boundedness of diffusivity enables us to prove that this um, non-classical symmetry solution is in fact stable. Wouldn't have got it published in Proceedings of Royal Society unless I found a way to do that. The other papers, I haven't found, always found a way to do that and I haven't tried to put it in a journal like that. Go to slightly lower ones to be honest. So, so in summary, um, there's this class of nonlinear PDE, um, the theta by dt is any linear operator acting on u, where you use the integral of diffusivity, plus a reaction term that's nonlinear depending on the dependent variable, whether that be population or temperature or whatever, or soil water content. And uh, it, it has an additional non-classical symmetry, uh, provided there's a certain relationship between the nonlinear diffusivity and the reaction term. Um, if, you, if, you if you propose a diffusivity function, then you can explicitly construct the reaction term. Uh, but more likely, you have a, a given structure for the reaction term, and then you obtain the nonlinear diffusivity by solving a nonlinear ordinary differential equation which comes out pretty directly, and I don't understand why it works so well, as the fixed point of a contraction map. And um, that symmetry reduction gives us separation of variables. So the Kirchhoff variable is just exponential in time, times a function of R that miraculously comes out to be the solution of the linear, but not, not even a nonlinear PDE and one fewer variables. Go figure. Sometimes you can be lucky, but maybe there's more to this than luck that I don't really understand. Maybe Fuzzle's already worked it out, but I haven't. Um, and I can say glibly, this class includes many useful reaction diffusion equations uh, with D non-constant and theta itself not being exponential in T, but approaching it uh, as it dies away. So. Uh, and I, I mentioned the nonlinear diffusivity that I use in soil water flow to solve things exactly. Uh, in that case, U being exponential, blowing up to infinity, implies that this soil water content approaches its maximum B, which is placed in there to be just above the saturated water content. So you can't force things to go too high above saturated water content, naturally. This works out. So it's certainly... Um, the dynamics of theta and the dynamics of u doesn't have to be the same. Why does uh, this iterative map converge so rapidly when the contraction factor in L infinity is as large as 0.97? I'm more interested in applications these days than functional analysis, as nice a subject as it is, but I'd like someone to look at it. And um, these are some um, references if anybody wants them, I can send you a copy of the talk later, and um, I want to pay tribute to these papers that I think were most influential on me, and apologies to other people here that have also contributed, uh, but these are things that I read early that were uh, quite influential, and I, and I should mention, of course, that Avzhenikov uh, had ideas of partial invariance long before Blumen, and Blumen really acknowledges that because he even went to the trouble to translate our Genocot's book into English. So that's, that's basically the end of my talk. <coughs> open the floor for questions, comments. One, two, um, the models that you study? Do you find is the dynamics? 
Uh, right, the dynamics doesn't. It's just the um, the diffusivity function that corresponds to a reaction term to make this solution work. That, that's all I'm doing there. Yes. Yeah. Well, even in that case, should have some kind of phase transition. So um, instead of studying this in terms of symmetry, we thought about studying the perspective of the only looking at the phase transition, fixed points, phase space of these No, actually I haven't, I must say. No, I can answer straight out, no. Yeah. Um, the problem with the extrusion radius for the fishing. Yeah. Um, so how would you go about improving on that figure that you got on the hundred kilometers? Oh well, um, you know, this is a of course this is a matter of ecological management. Um, not, number one, you could do what you do here in major national parks. You you build a big fence around the enclosure if you can. And if it's not a big fence, it's a sequence of outposts of people with guns to stop poachers. Right, um, but for fishing exclusion zones, that's that's really not possible. With something of that size. Uh, so you're really asking a question about ecological management. Um, do you think the model sufficient though? You, you describe what the exclusion is. Oh, actually, I do, because it comes out to be reasonable numbers that that agrees with people's experience. And um, of course, you know, you can stock things. You can keep stocking. Uh, you can. Um, <coughs> Of course, there are other management systems. You can impose annual quotas on various species. Do they maybe change the radius depending on the season as well? Like, you know, in September, when there's a generalization. Oh, yeah, there might sure. might be a lot of, you know, new you know, babies coming through. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, you're quite right. You're yeah. quite right, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we do that with um, fisheries already. There are certain times of the year when you can't take various species. Uh, I, I can't incorporate time dependence uh, in this model. Uh, but I can't incorporate non-autonomy in that way. I can incorporate spatial dependence as I said. Two questions. So one is about uh, the Facebook there, partial billions. Uh, I know I've studied partial billions when it comes to platforming from uh, um, the to yeah. 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 Secondly, um, when we were discussing the uh, problem that relates to um, population model, because, you know, uh, we talked about the civil population condition. Yeah. That's a kind of special boundary condition. Yes, um, you, you can impose any linear boundary condition and solve it with this model. So that's the simplest boundary condition. All boundary conditions we deal with are idealized in some way. That, that one is the most ideal, that you're capturing everything that ventures to the edge. Uh, but as I said, you can also impose a, a linear condition uh, that you're taking out um, fish, for example, at a rate proportional to the density. You can impose that one as well. So how about the time condition? Time condition. Uh, the, the PD has a time derivative of it. Yes. So what would be a time condition? Because if the population is zero, I would expect zero solution everywhere. So what would be the kind of time condition for the problem? Uh, so you specify the zero population at a particular boundary, and you need to also impose a time condition. At T zero, maybe this kind of population uh, in the zone? Or um, you mean initial condition? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, well, these, these are symmetry reductions, and uh, we can only impose a certain uh, number of time conditions. Um, these, these are not the most ideal. Uh, they're still useful. Um, for example, um, I could go back to the one uh, with the fertilized egg and um, show you that um, if, 
if we go back in time, we can't go further back in time to show a negative concentration of calcium, but back to this point, we have some initial concentration of calcium which is artificial. It's not bad, it's a small amount, but it's artificial, and it doesn't change much the character of the real solution. So if, if you did put in an initial condition of zero and solve that numerically, I'm sure uh, the solution would come out looking much like that at later times anyway. No, I'm not assuming steady states anywhere. This is time to be. No worries. I'm just curious about the body condition. You know, it's, it's not good for everybody, but it's okay. When, uh, when oh, no, no. No, 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 because. I would say I've, I've reduced this nonlinear PDE to a linear PDE yeah. in one fewer variables. Yeah. You know how to solve that linear PDE with nonlinear boundary conditions, say a step arm conditional power to you. We can do some of those, but this is still not easy. So the first thing we look at when we just see if these give any useful solutions at all with linear boundary conditions. Yeah, any linear boundary yeah. conditions. Yeah. yeah. Well, is it any condition you know, we can is work about the that boundary condition is not work about the no, any, any linear boundary condition that we need in mathematical modelling, we can solve here. Any linear boundary condition. It's, it's really good for me. Yeah, oh, no, that, even that's unusual in symmetry analysis, I must say. So, the, the interesting question comes up from the first book where you get the partial linearization coming up. So, those uh, non local conditions. Yeah. It looks like it's related to a kind of thing where it's the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I, I knew you would cotton on to this. Yes, we are, we are doing something like that, like that also. We, uh, at the moment, uh, working on other examples of this type of partial invariance for other systems of PDEs mm -hmm. and trying to develop a general theory of this. Yes. Yep. And, I, and I should have said at the back, you, you are partially right. It, um, there is time dependence in the boundary conditions in the end because everything's multiplied by e to the minus at. So I, I should have understood that was part of the question. So all that, all that means is I can, I can then say that we, say for example, in the case of water, we we're feeding in a, a finite amount of water into the system each day. This is an, a, a diurnal type model. And, and for the egg system, there's only a finite amount of calcium in there, and that's the amount that's released uh, after fertilization. Do you know the comments? Don't you think? What about the people elsewhere? Are they have they got questions? I, I think there are some people there. there but they, they don't have their microphones on yet. Let's try it. Are there anybody looking in to ask a question? Everybody's quiet. <laughs> All right. Uh, we thank you very much for coming right. on. And thank you for oh. This is a uh, remember us. Oh, thank you, you so much. If you don't have coffee anymore, you can use it. No, I will have coffee many times. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.